What makes the Indiana 5G zone special is the fo our focus to take very advanced technology like millimeter wave or machine learning or software defined radios and see how it can make lives of Americans better, you know, saving money on energy, uh, making transportation better, but more importantly, also creating jobs and making the community better. We are lucky right now to have three people who are really working uh, at a national stage. Each of the three people are, is actually pretty famous in their own right. Uh, we have uh, Representative Eric Swalwell from Congress, who's been really championing uh, really a, a lot of uh, bipartisan bills to not only bring, uh, not only invest in innovation, but to create jobs. We have Dave Roberts from the Indiana 5G zone working uh, at a state level. And we have uh, Jean Holmes from uh, the city of LA. She's the deputy mayor. Uh, Jean's actually pretty famous in her own right. And uh, I encourage you after this to look at her YouTube videos, which are kind of pretty fantastic, where she talks about the use of technology. Uh, each one of them, uh, we're very lucky to have. Uh, I see that uh, uh, the congressman is dialing in while working as we would expect him. So Congressman, you know, you have led a lot of uh, bipartisan bills focusing on technology, focusing on the relation between investment and national security and jobs for national security. It would be great perhaps if you could provide us an insight into your own thoughts and Congress in terms of uh, your perspective on the, the path we can take here. Thank you uh, to Indiana 5G for hosting this. And nice to see some Californians online and, and Lauren Louie, a, a family friend who invited me on this. I'm actually driving from Washington, D.C. Uh, to Indiana. My wife, it's her turn to drive right now as I do that. She's a Hoosier, uh, grew up in Columbus, Indiana, and uh, we go there about five to six times uh, a year. So we've got uh, a four-year-old and a two-year-old in the back seat. So who the, who the heck knows uh, you know, what's going to happen? But uh, my interest um, representing a Bay Area congressional district is, is making sure that America is at the cutting edge uh, of 5G and that we, you know, do not, you know, cede these uh, technologies uh, to China or, you know, Scandinavian countries who uh, certainly dominate the market uh, right now, that we, you know, can protect uh, data and also create American jobs. Uh, so that, you know, that's first plan, which I hope is a bipartisan plan uh, to not only have bridges and roads and hills, uh, but also to invest in connecting the disconnected. And we've seen in this pandemic uh, that uh, the disconnected are the students who live in dead zones and, you know, are not able to learn through distance learning the same way uh, as students who are uh, connected uh, through broadband or, or 5G. Uh, the disconnected are, you know, families uh, who work from home, but also are working from home in dead zones and are not as connected as many of their peers. And so to connect rural America, America, but not just rural America, but my district, uh, which is uh, in the heart of the Bay Area, uh, there are a number of uh, residents, uh, up to 100,000 residents uh, who live in dead zones and, and uh, you know, uh, broadband deserts, uh, so to speak. And so I think there's opportunities there uh, on the connection side. And then on the cyber side, you know, we're seeing right now how important it is, you know, to protect uh, our, protect and secure our connections, whether it's on hygiene uh, or, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, on making sure you have, um, you know, insulated, uh, you know, networks that are separate, especially for critical infrastructure, you know, from, uh, you know, the outer uh, networks that could be accessed uh, by the public. So uh, that that's where I'm working on the intelligence, uh, judiciary and Homeland Security committees. And uh, I'm looking forward to this panel discussion and, and hearing what the other panelists say and what we can all do to collaborate. Great. Thank you for those words, uh, Congressman. And, and thank you for taking time out while you're driving your family. We really appreciate that. This is kind of unique uh, view of uh, American politics here. It's kind of live and unedited for those of you people watching. I'd, I'd like to turn to uh, Dave Roberts uh, from the uh, state of Indiana. Uh, for those of you who don't know, he was actually one of the vis visionaries who actually helped uh, kick off and fund the Indiana 5G zone uh, quite early in the process. Uh, you know, before there was all this excitement in 5G, he saw it as something that the state should get involved in. And uh, Dave would kind of love some of your thoughts, uh, building on some of uh, the congressman's thoughts at the federal level. 
I'm happy to do oh. it today. Thanks. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect, uh, Representative, for what you're doing and uh, how you're doing it, uh, bringing, the, bringing the family here to Indiana. Um, and like you mentioned, partnerships are key uh, in de-risking uh, any, any significant investment that a state or, or the federal government decides to make in advanced technologies. And uh, in a demonstration of partnership, um, you know, we have a Republican governor. I'd like to extend an invitation to you uh, as a Democratic representative to, uh, to hang out with us if you're around town this weekend for the 500. Uh, but understand if family uh, demands are going to keep you busy. Um, you know, I would say that also it's important to know. And, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I would, I would just say that it's important <laughs> for sure. Um, you know, it's, it's important to us in Indiana to take advantage of disruptive trends. And one of the things that we've been active in is actually creating innovation-based um, labs like the 5G lab around a couple of different verticals. And um, we're always listening to industry though. We're in, including our uh, academic partners. We're bringing in great um, industry partners uh, to inform the type of equipment behind me and in this facility. Uh, that's that's returning value to the industry from day one. So um, that was really the inspiration behind getting the 5G lab set up here, reflecting the investment AT&T and Verizon made in the Indianapolis ecosystem. So um, yeah, those are just a couple of quick principles that, that went into play here to uh, get the 5G lab set up. Uh, but the team here is just fantastic, taking that er early kernel of an idea and putting in motion. Great, thanks for that. I, I'd like to introduce uh, Gene Holmes, who actually has uh, done quite a lot of speaking. I'd encourage anybody to look at her uh, YouTube videos on things like technology and privacy, how it affects the community. I, I think they're they're quite educational. Gene, I, I know you, you've got a kind of unique perspective uh, from a technology perspective, but now working at the community level, the city of LA level, would love your insight on you know, how do we harness these technologies to really help people right at the community level so that, you know, they don't get lost or feel lost in these kind of big ticket programs? Sure, and thanks so much for having me here today and a huge kudos to Indiana. Um, great work on the Innovation Zone. And it's just, it's great to see leaders kind of really stepping into the opportunity because um, it can be a little daunting at times and to really think about that idea of public private partnerships and a huge shout out and thanks to the congressman for his support on the legislative aspects of all of this um, it can be complex and difficult at best uh, so la uh, through a lot of those partnerships with verizon at&t t-mobile crown castle comcast dish i don't want to forget anybody spectrum starlink which who is based here with spacex um, all of our service providers were part of helping us to become the first 5G city in America. And um, since 2018, we've been living in a 5G world. And I think that that kind of plays out in different ways when we actually think about it. I'm, I'm so grateful that that was in place and we had a lot of that infrastructure before the pandemic because we'd actually started building out the, across the digital divide. And so we, we're very data-driven here in Los Angeles with Mayor Eric Garcetti, and we're really looking at not just the areas of single coverage or no coverage, which we've now eliminated no coverage areas, but making sure that there's affordable and reasonably fast coverage in every spot. And sometimes that means doing a big lift, like during the pandemic, um, T-Mobile was great and provided 18,000 Wi-Fi hotspots for our homeless and foster care students who dropped out at a rate of 90% last year. And so we, part of bringing them back in was getting that basic connectivity and support to them. And then also with Starry Internet, um, who helped us to provide free broadband high speed into our public housing, um, changing technologies and changing ways of infrastructure mean that you have new opportunities in places where you may not have had it before. Many rural areas in America will benefit from things like Starlink's um, ability to access uh, different areas without actually having to build some of the trenching and physical infrastructure. And I think this really just sets us all up for, for the, some of the things the Congressman said. Uh, the idea of innovation where we can, if you, you can't be a 5G company and do 5G innovation if you don't live in a 5G city, right? If, if you can't actually build on that kind of a network. Uh, being able to provide jobs all across the spectrum from entry level, from apprenticeship jobs to, you know, uh, technology jobs and being able to have that in the city where you get that benefit. 
And then also the idea of having these technologies in place mean that we can start to really think differently about transportation safety, pedestrian safety, air quality, um, and the kinds of things that run on a not just a 5G speed, I think as the Congressman pointed out, but the density in which we're getting benefits at a 5G um, network. So at 4G, we had say 1500 um, 4G devices across the city of Los Angeles, which is about 500 square miles and 4 million residents. And now we'll be having close to 8,000 with 5G, which just lets us penetrate neighborhoods we never got to before. And so I just think there's a huge amount of opportunity here. It, it can only be done in public-private partnership. Um, even though you know we'll talk about municipal broadband, it's always meant to be uh, you know as an augmentation or support to some of the work that's been going on with, with the great companies across the world, and particularly here in Los, in, in America. And then um, just thinking about how we start to gather that data from those devices and things like with air quality, we have a NASA grant right now going on where some of our 5G uh, locations also have air quality sensors. We gather that data, connect it to NASA satellite data, and we're actually now able with 92% accuracy to predict the air quality for the next few weeks to help people who have asthma and who are long haul COVID uh, sufferers to be able to know where to go to be safer in the city. Great, thanks for that. So. You know, what's kind of interesting is uh, our, our three guests actually hadn't met before uh, on this format or coordinated their comments. And it's interesting that all three really touched on the importance of coverage for people who, who are either low income or out of region to, to make it. And, and I, I think that's great. Uh, you know, one of the, we've got a couple of projects in the Indiana 5G zone around lowering the cost of coverage, making it more plug and play during actually rural communities but, but also uh, dense urban environments where millimeter wave can scatter and give you lower throughput. So it, it was kind of interesting. Uh, for those of people who are online, I'd also encourage you to use the chat. You can actually ask questions to this, uh, to our guests here. Uh, but going back to uh, Congressman, you know, do you have any uh, pieces of advice uh, as, as you drive across America? A actually, you're, you're heading to the race. So I, I don't know if you know there there are, great events that I think once we're off this, uh, they'll invite you to. Uh, I am in, I am here in Silicon Valley, I'm not there, but there's a big team there. So connect with them and I'm sure they can take you to some fun places. But Congressman, do you have any thoughts that you'd like to share uh, with the community here in terms of what uh, the, at the state, at the, uh, at the county level, they should be thinking about uh, given your insight uh, served here? Yeah, and that's that's a great question. And we're at a, a time in, in my ten years in service, uh, for the first time, uh, earmarks are back. Uh, that's they're now called congressional directed spending, and, and they were taken away for a long time because of abuses, lack of transparency, uh, benefiting for profit uh, companies. But now uh, restrictions have been put in place that every member of Congress can make a request for a community project. Uh, as long as it's a nonprofit. Uh, so if you have a nonprofit organization or even a city, uh, county, state project, uh, like an innovation hub or an innovation zone, the member can request up to $10 million uh, for that project. And if you get members, you know, in the Indianapolis area, you have, uh, you know, a number of different members who represent that congressional area. If they band together, you can get up to 30, $40 million. And so I would encourage you over the next couple of years, you know, to talk uh, across the country, wherever you are, uh, with your congressional representatives about projects you have in the 5G uh, innovation space and, and see if they would request, uh, you know, to fund those. And we are certainly doing that in our district. But it's an I the idea is, you know, the members know the needs of the local uh, districts, but it's also a way to get Republicans and Democrats to work together because uh, we all have priorities and needs in our district. So I, I would look at those. Great, thank you, Congressman, for that. Uh, for those listening, uh, you, you, so the Congressman is truly dedicated, driving with his family and telling you where to raise money <laughs> as he heads to the race. Uh, Dave Roberts, uh, next to you, sir. I believe someone who does actually have tickets to the race, Congressman, you might wanna call him directly. Uh, Dave, yeah, they're going uh, fast. <laughs> they're going fast. Uh, I think he'll call you right after. Uh, All right. So, uh, yeah, one thing I would point out is here in Indiana, we've set aside $500 million of our uh, American Rescue Plan funding 
that's available to local communities. We're asking them to send in regional plans. We call it the Ready Plan, R-E-A-D-I, where we're asking the, the local counties and cities to uh, present us with plans on how they intend to use some of their resources because they received, at least here in Indiana, an aggregate of $2.6, $2.7 billion in addition to the $3 billion that came into the state at, at our level. So we wanna partner with them and make sure that their plans uh, are augmented and, and heading in the right direction, especially in, in terms of digital infrastructure. Great, great. Thanks for that. And, and for our last uh, closing thought, I would love to uh, come back to uh, Jean, uh, who, who like me is in California and we are not going to the race, but uh, <laughs> we'll watch it. So, so Jean, could you share any kind of insights? I mean, you, you, you're, you're kind of at the frontline grassroots level on what we should think from a policy perspective to make sure, you know, as, as the Congressman mentioned, there is this funding out there uh, you know, five to $10 million uh, that can be earmarked for innovation. You know, how, what would you want people in other congressional districts to, to think about as, as they look at different requests or, or how do we shape it to, to create the most value for, for, for people in our cities and our communities? Sure, so I think there's two ways to do this. And, and I just had a huge shout out for the 500. My neighborhood growing up, we always all got together, listened to the race. We all had our favorite drivers. It's one of my favorite childhood memories. So just, uh, we may be states apart, but um, just a huge uh, thanks to, to having that as part of my childhood. Um, so I think that we, we kind of kind of look at these innovation spaces in two ways. One is focused on the on the residents and our and our, our uh, the folks who are living in the cities how do we get them capacity financial um, sorry, digital literacy and that kind of thing but there's another component which we're starting to promote here in Los Angeles which is how do we help entrepreneurs who are looking to kind of break the digital divide in different ways um, whether it's better provisioning of devices digital literacy training other kinds of innovations not necessarily in competition with the telecoms but it's like in a different way so we're looking at actually creating incubators around the, the digital divide but particularly for entrepreneurs and helping to nurture those businesses as they move forward we've grown a few here in los angeles that are just great breakouts but we want to make that part of the regular like ecosystem of, of la and so i think there's a couple of different ways to look at it and i encourage everybody to apply it's going to make a big difference and, and with that, I, I'd like to thank our three speakers uh, who've really provided <laughs> in a very short time a view from a federal, state, and kind of county city level. Thank you for all. I uh, all, all three people actually have a lot of online content, and I'd encourage all of you to uh, view all of that. 